to Luke chapter 20. Uh, put a little piece of paper there or put your Bible marker. Or if you turn on your Bible, I don't know how you, would, how you mark it if you turn it on, but hey. Because we're going to be there in just a few minutes. I do want to comment on a couple of things. Number one, um, our Cuba ministry, is, as most of you know, we go to uh, Cuba. We take two teams down twice a year. We support a hundred and some pastors. I'm not supposed to say that, but that's what we do. We support about 100 pastors every year. That changes a little bit as the pastors, uh, their church grows, and then we, we take on more, and we've been doing this for many years. Uh, but we need about seven more of you, seven or eight more of you to go down in, uh, I believe it's March. It's, it's coming up. Yes, it is March. And basically, we want your suitcases. We're going to be smuggling. I don't like to use that word, but that's what we do. We bring things in, and it's exciting. Um, you don't have to worry about being arrested or anything. Well, maybe a little. <laughs> but um, it's going to happen to you. We, we've been doing this a long time. So we need you. If you'd like to go down to the island of Cuba, I mean, it is still run by communists. It's, a whole, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really an experience. You stay in a nice hotel um, <clears throat> right on the beach. Um, suffering for, I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, <laughs> I've been there seven times, <laughs> suffering for the Lord. Anyway, uh, we need seven or more, seven or eight more of you. If you'd like to go, you can call Al Green, 443-2777. You know, I used to know, not to brag, but I used to know everyone's phone number in the whole church, hundreds. I I can't remember where my keys are, but if I dial a phone number, I can remember it for months, right? And then the church got bigger and my mind went on overload. I, I can't do that anymore. But anyway, all right. Also, Shadow Day. I know this probably only uh, applies to a few of you, but the reason why we have our schools, our elementary school, our junior high school, and our high school, is not to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those are important. But that's not why we have our schools. We have our schools to teach our children a Christian worldview. That's why we have our schools. That's the number one reason why we put the money into it. That's why they exist. If your kids go to a public school five days a week, six or seven hours a day, they are getting preached, preached a worldview that is not Christian. You've got to understand that. I don't want to, uh, you know, I, that's just the way it is. Our goal is that when our, as you take our kids through our, our school, when they, when they graduate in tw 12th grade, we want them to understand and have a Christian worldview. It's done in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm, I'm working on that right now, uh, <clears throat> on, on how to make that even uh, stronger. Mark and I are working on that. Uh, but that's why our school exists. Our high school is half as much as the other Christian high schools in San Diego County. Our church invests in it. It's, if you have high school kids, we want to help you. We have a shadow day where you can come. You can, you can bring your student. He shadows a student. Uh, I think it's half the day. And, they have, and you can... I challenge you, if you have a high school student, just come to one of our chapels on Tuesday. See those kids worshiping God and the power of God there? You'll want your kids to be there. Why am I crying? I don't know. Because I'm passionate about it. All right. The other thing is the celebration dinner tonight. If you have signed up, many of you have, probably, probably most of you in here, we have filled up that whole ballroom. <coughs> um, I don't think there's any room, nothing. I, I don't know. You can call, call Don Bastrom. Everybody call Don Bastrom. 507-1904. 507-1904. Like I said, I know. And his home number, 466-3991. He'll just, everybody call him. Call Don and ask if there's space left, 507-1904. <laughs> but anyway, if you signed up, we bought a dinner for you. I hope you show up. Um, it's going to be fun. Okay, We're going to have a great time. Um, hope you like chicken. That's right. All right. I think that's all. I could go on, but we need to go into the message. Yes, we do. Okay, um, I'm going to start by reading a familiar passage. Most of you know it, Psalms 119, 
105. And just keep it up there for a minute. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I'd pro- 95, 98%. If you know this verse, you've heard it many times before. You've you probably memorized it. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, what that scripture says basically is God's word, if you practice it, puts you on a path in your life that will bring you to the abundant life that Jesus talked about. You will experience the, the blessings and promises of God. Since this is true, let's consider the fact that there are 500 scriptures on prayer, 500 scriptures on faith, on how to pray, how to have faith. But there are, according to many people, close to 2,000 verses in the Bible, passages in the Bible that have to do with money. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but the last three weeks we've been talking about money. Charles talked about it, Mark talked, and I'm going to talk about it this morning. I'm going to come at it from a little different angle. 16, 16 out of the 38 parables of Jesus dealt with money. And I believe Jesus talked about it so much, the Bible talks about it so much, because how we spend our money reveals what's in our hearts. It reveals our priorities, our affection. Now, if you're sitting here this morning, you came on this drizzly day, you came to church, I have to assume that you want to handle your money wisely. You're a Christian, you want to handle your money wisely. I'm sure 98% of you would say, amen, I want to handle my money wisely. And I'm going to make a statement here. For most American Christians, the problem is not, the problem is not a lack of money, the problem is self-control. Say it again. For most Americans, because we're rich, all of us, even the poorest of us. I mean, I just came from a country where the average salary a day is $6. It's not a matter of not having enough, it's a matter of self-control. It's the inability to say no. See that fancy car? You look at yours and go, who? You're ugly. You're beautiful. You're ugly. You're beautiful. You're ugly. You're beautiful. I want that. And so you charge it. Mark talked about it last week. You see what others have and you want what they have. And so you put it on credit. Or worse yet, you use your tithes or your offerings that God has called holy to himself, and you go buy these things. Here's another way of stating the problem. You and I so often aren't content to live at the level that God provides. Sure is quiet in here. So often as Christians, you and I are not satisfied to live at the level that God provides. I am not saying you shouldn't try to get a better job. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to better your family circumstances. I'm just saying so much of the time, the problem lies is that you and, lies in the fact that you and I are not content at the level that God has provided. And we all, and so many of us, I don't want to say all, but so many of us believe that if we had just a little bit more, Things would be okay. They did a study one time and uh, found that a large percentage of Americans say if they just had $500 more a month, that's all they need. $500 to $1,000 more a month, that's all we need. But you know, you get to $500 to $1,000 more, and guess what? Pretty soon, if I just had another $500,000, I am making more money than I've ever made in my life, and I have no money. I was the poorest I've ever been. That may be because my my children are getting, getting older. Man, sure you want your kids to go to college until you look at how much it costs. Well, have you ever thought about trade school? That's, that's <laughs> no, no. So often our desires exceed our means, and we spend more than we have. We go into debt, and Mark talked about that last week. You and I will always be going into debt robbing God until we learn to be faithful with what God has given us, until we learn to be content at the level that we find ourselves, that God is providing. In Matthew 25, I don't want to turn there, but in Matthew 25, 
Jesus tells a parable about um, an owner that gives three servants three different amounts of money. Then he goes away on a journey. He, He comes back, and he is happy with the way two of his servants invested the money, how they used the money that he gave them. And he praises them, and he says this in verse 21. And he says this also in verse 23 for those two servants who used the money wisely. He said, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, entering the joy of your master. What I want to do this morning is I want to answer the question, what qualities can we see in a good and faithful servant? What qualities do we have to have in the use of our finances that would cause God to look at our life and the way that we use the finances that he has given us for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to look at three qualities. The first quality of a good and faithful servant is this. He understands that God owns everything. Now, it seems to me, I preached this a while back. I looked, I tried to find it. I can't, I couldn't. So I don't know how long ago it was. But I'm 60 now. I, I have an excuse. I have old, old timers. That's what my son called my, when, when my father had Alzheimer's, he always used to say, yeah, grandpa has old timers. God owns everything. This is a basic truth. This is foundational. And as a Christian, we got no problem with that. God owns the mountains, the trees, the cattle on a thousand hills. Got no problem with that. Hey, Amen. Preach it, brother. God owns everything. Let's just read a couple of scriptures here. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. When I used to teach crown financial classes, this was the first passage we would have those in the class memorize. Why? Because it's foundational. You will never be a good manager of your resources unless until you understand this principle. Psalm 89, 11. The heavens are yours, the earth is yours, all the world, the world and all it contains. Psalm 50. The world is mine and all it contains. This is obviously God speaking. Deuteronomy 10. Behold the Lord your God. Behold to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Exodus 19.5. It says there in the end, for all the earth is mine. 1 Corinthians 10.26. For the earth of the Lord is all it contains. Again, we don't have any problems. The Bible says everything belongs to God. But it's easy to say the cattle on a thousand hills, the, the, the high Sierras, the deserts. But living in that reality is something else. And that's what we're going to talk about here for a few minutes. Are you in Luke chapter 20? Let's start with verse 9. And Jesus began to tell the people this parable. Luke chapter 20, verse 9. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard Due to them, he will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they say, may it never be. But Jesus looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Now I want you to to really understand what Jesus is getting at here. I want you to understand that the vineyard being talked about here is the world and everything in it. God's vineyard is the world. 
And the other thing that's being talked about here is a person's unwillingness to submit to the owner of the vineyard. A person's unwillingness to submit to God. And for our purpose this morning, what I, what I want us to think about, for you to think about, because I've already thought a lot about it for myself, is <clears throat> to think about this vineyard in terms of your own vineyard. Everything in your life is your vineyard. See, we have no problem thinking about God's vineyard, generally speaking. But when we start thinking about the vineyard that God has given you and I, it starts to get squeamish and it gets really quiet in here. The people in this parable, before God or before this master gave, him, gave them um, a vineyard, they were, I would assume, they were homeless, they didn't have any place to live, and they didn't have any food. Not only does God give them place, a place to live, a job and food, he says you can share in the harvest. You can share in the profits. But who owned the vineyard? God, the master. The question I want to answer this morning, how do these, this is, this is the crust of it, how do these people get to the point where they saw that vineyard as their own? So that when the master came and wanted his share, they resented it. They almost thought, they almost looked at this um, owner of the vineyard as a thief. Well, I think it's pretty easy to understand. Because day after day, they got up, make sure that vineyard was uh, watered, plucked the... Uh, the bugs off, and they didn't have you know, DDT back then. They, you know, they got rid of it. They loved this vineyard. They took care of this vineyard. When there wasn't rain, they carried water to the plants. They got up early. They went to bed late, all for the vineyard. All they could see was their labor. It got to the point where they had ownership of it. They had loved it so much, it, be, it became almost like theirs. And they looked forward to the harvest. They were excited about the harvest. And then a guy they hadn't seen for who knows how long shows up and says, give me my share. And it might have been a large share. The same thing happens to us. We know the ones, we know who gets up early in the morning, drives to work, hassles with all the hassles that we have at our different jobs, whether it's employees or employers, just all that. Our back hurts. We work hard. We, and then... We look forward to the paycheck. And when the paycheck comes, the name on it says David F. Hoffman. It doesn't say God. So you get the paycheck and you have the added, I earned it. I worked. I earned it. And then God comes and says, I want some of it. And we resent it. God asks for his share. We resent it. A lot of times, it's almost like we feel God's trying to steal something that we worked for. So the question I have for each of you this morning, who owns your vineyard? And only you can answer that. But I can tell you this, until you answer that question biblically, you will never be able to be a good manager and come into all God wants for you with your finances. Now, I really believe that it's hard for Americans, American Christians, to understand, to concede, and to live as if God really owns our vineyard. Because we got so much. I remember years ago, I didn't have anything. I had an old rotten Datsun truck. Some of you don't even know what a Datsun is. Nissan. <laughs> Datsun blue truck. And a bunch of bills. God, it's all yours. You can have it. It's yours. Take it. <laughs> it's yours. And then you start making a little money. Yeah, God, it's yours. And then you have a little bit more and you get a bit nicer house. God, it's kind of yours. You know, I just can't. I, so I, I believe this is this. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because it's a difficult concept for American Christians. Well, we believe God owes everything. But when you really come down to it, most of us 
have a hard time with the, with the, the reality that God owns everything. We say it, but, de- but do you make decisions and live like he owns everything? Only you can answer that. You know, I went, just got back from El Salvador, and a lot of these people live in these shacks. They've got nothing. So it's, God, everything I have is yours. I mean, it's just easier. I'm sure that uh, everybody in the world struggles with selfishness, but I'm, I'm talking about us here in America. I think it's tough. But until you and I concede intellectually and practically that God owns everything in our life and everything belongs to him, you and I will never come in to what God has for us. Financially or spiritually. You see, we're going to talk a little bit about it in just a minute, but, well... I don't want to get ahead of myself. Until you and I come, concede intellectually and practically that God owns everything in our vineyard, we will not reap the benefits that God and a lot of his, a lot of his promises in the Bible. That's just a fact. And it's such a foundational fact, I'm going to move on. I don't see how you can argue that. Secondly, a good and faithful steward of the finances that God has given you, that good and faithful steward understands that not only does God own everything, but he or she is God's manager. We're working for him. Colossians 3.23 says, when you work, don't work as if you're working for your boss or yourself. Work as if you're working for God. He's the owner of your vineyard. The truth is that most of the stress that you and I face and anxiety over money is a result of being bad managers of the money that God has given us. Come on, it's the truth. Suppose you have $500 left in your checking account and you run off to wherever, buy $200 worth of clothes because you have to have them, and the $85 lamp and $30 of iTunes music. I mention that only because I keep getting these bills from iTunes. I was unwise in that I gave all three kids my visa number and they put it on their iTunes account. (laughs) Do you know how many songs, one of those, like 10, 20,000 songs? You'll never listen to that. And then, of course, now they have 30,000 or whatever it is. We got to have the new one. No, you don't. But anyway... So, you spend the $200 in clothes, the $30 for iTunes, the $85 for a lamp, and then you come home, and in in a a, a moment of sanity, oh boy, I don't have enough money for gas. So, what do you do? You go up to the gas pump, take out your plastic, whoop, and you, you know, nowadays it's 80 bucks. And you don't have, you get to Albertsons or wherever it is, and you go, whoa, wow, $30 short, zip, there goes the card. Now, you fast forward six months, eight months, 10 months, 23 months, 24 months. Before you know it, you're seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars in debt on your credit card, and that's where a lot of you sit right now. I know that to be true. Because I talk to you. A good manager looks at the coming expenses before he or she makes a purchase. And if you want the clothes or the CD or the music, you save for it. We Americans just don't want to wait for the accumulation necessary to buy the things that we want. My father's generation got it. We don't. We could go into reasons why, but why? My father uh, grew up in the uh, Depression. They had very little. It was always amazing to me when, when I wrote my, my book on contentment. I dedicated the book to my father. Do you know, the whole time, his whole life, I never heard him complain about not having enough. Not one time. Not one time. And it's because he never had anything when he was a kid. He just, you know, he was content. If he didn't have the money, he didn't buy it. The Bible says, Proverbs 21.5 says this, 
the plans of the diligent, the good manager, lead to advantage. But everyone who's hastily, hastily just spends, comes to poverty. Mark did a great job last, last week talking about debt. If you weren't here, go get the tape. They're not tapes anymore. Go get the CD. <laughs> Pretty soon they won't be CDs, they'll be something else. A good manager takes what God has given them, ties 10%, saves a little, keeps a little to uh, give as an offering, and then budgets the rest. A good manager learns to live at the level that God has provided. But Dave, you just don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. It all comes down to a willingness to live within the means that God has provided. And I don't, you know, I'm not saying, so I don't do this three times. I don't know if I said this before, but I'm not saying you shouldn't try to better your situation for your family. It's not what I'm talking about. It's that you, you learn to be satisfied. Maybe you don't need that four-bedroom house. Maybe you have to downsize to a three-bedroom house. What's so bad about that? Most of the world has the whole family living in one room. I'm just saying. Mark made a very good case last week, and he is, and it is true. When you have debt, it's just over you like a, I mean, it's always there. And credit card companies, I mean, Macy's and all these, do they, is Macy's still around? I don't know. I got to be careful. What, whatever store. Blockbuster. Of course, they're, they're not, not them. Uh, whatever, stores over there. They want you to get their credit card, Kohl's. You know, I forgot to pay $5 on a Kohl's credit card one time. And the next thing I know, I've got bad credit, and I can't even refinance my house for a $5. I forgot about it. And these people kept bugging me, you know, kept calling me. And I didn't know they were calling me about a $5 thing. And I just would, you know, stop calling me. $5. I'm not upset at Kohl's. Good heavens. Anyway, credit card companies, all these stores, they want you to put things on credit. They'll give you 10%. Have you noticed? You buy, put this on credit card, we'll give you 10% off, of course. Because they hope you don't pay it. You charge too much, and then every month you only, you only pay the minimum payment so that to buy that new dress or skirt or slacks or, or, or jacket or whatever, you pay for it four or five times before you pay it off. Luke 16 says this. He was faithful in a very little, is faithful in much. He was unrighteous in a very little, is unrighteous in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust true riches to you? I don't like this verse. Because what this verse tells me is that the way that I handle my money, it's like a test. The way I handle my money gives God a real good picture of how I'll handle spiritual anointings. Things in the spiritual realm. Ew. Sobering passage. God is looking for people who are responsible. And if, they're, and if they're responsible, he'll give them more responsibility. How we manage our money is a test. Say test. test. It's a test. Money and how we spend it tests our hearts. It tests our commitment to being content and obedient. It's sobering to think that every time you and I are tempted to overspend, it's a test. At, am I going to be moved by something that I can't afford, or am I going to be content where I'm at? And if I really need this thing, am I going to come up with a plan to save for it every month until I can pay for it? Be, money and what we do with it tests our hearts. What's in our heart? Do I have self-control? Am I content with God's provision? Am I trustworthy? Can I resist temptation? What is my value system? Am I submitted? All these Questions are answered on how you and I spend our money. Finally, number three, because I have to move on, a good and faithful servant understands that God blesses generosity. Let's just look at a few scriptures here. Proverbs 22, 9. He who is generous will be blessed. Psalm 112, 5. 
It is well with a man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment. Luke 6, 38. And this is, the, this is the one that most of you know. Give, and it shall be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure, it shall be measured to you in return. And there are other uh, scriptures I taught. A while back, I preached a whole message on generosity. There's a lot of passages that, that definitely say the generous person will be blessed by God. Now, over the years, I've had many people come into my office who are in financial difficulties, great financial difficulties. And uh, a lot of them come to me because they heard that I had a couple successful businesses. They don't know that I also had several disasters. <laughs> Anyway, I don't want to get into all, all that because it's, it's funny, but oh my gosh. And not one time in all the 30 years of listening to people talk about their miserable financial situation have I ever had anybody in my office pray like this. Lord Jesus, I haven't tithed. I haven't given offerings. I haven't been generous. But I'm still convinced that this is the way to do it. So bless me, Lord Jesus. No one's ever said that. You know what they say? Lord, forgive me for being selfish. Forgive me for not tithing, which you've called holy to yourself. Forgive me for not giving offerings. Forgive me for not being generous. Please show me. I want to know in your word how to do it your way. That's what I hear. <laughs> the generous person understands the principle of sowing and reaping. Now, before I get into this a little bit, I understand in the American church that there's been a lot of abuse to it, but it doesn't disregard the truth of it. It's in the Word. So let's go ahead and read it. There are more passages than this, but this is the, kind of the prime one. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance in every good deed. A good steward understands if they're generous in sowing seeds, they're going to reap a harvest. They're going to reap a harvest in proportion to the plants that they see, the plants that they sow. The seeds that they sow. I'll get it right. Now, this promise of reaping and sowing was not given to create a selfish motive for giving. Did you hear what I said? This principle in the Word of God was not given to us to create a selfish motive for giving. It was given to us to free us from the fear of not having enough. Say it again. The principle of sowing and reaping, I believe, was given to us as believers in God to free us from the fear of not having enough. The reason why people don't tithe is they're afraid they won't have enough. The, people, why, the reason why people don't give offerings for missions or whatever, they believe they won't have enough. That if they give, <coughs> the end result will be that God won't come through and they will be sitting there in want. The unwise man has a bucket of, of, of uh, seeds, and he eats the seeds. The wise man, even though he's hungry and maybe he's hurting at, at the time, just eats a little, plants the seeds so that he has seeds, so, so that he has a harvest, and the seeds, and, the, and that harvest will feed his family, and he has seeds for the next, for the next harvest, for the next planting. Fear, not having enough, is what keeps us from giving to God. But the wise man knows you give, you get when you give. Now I've found the best way to conquer a lot of fears, and in this case the fear of not having enough, is to leverage it with another fear. <laughs> and we do it all the time. I'll bet there's not a... Let's talk about the fear of going to the dentist. I don't like 
Well, excuse me, there's a dentist in here. I love you. <laughs> I don't particularly like going to the dentist. I put it off. They've called me twice. I've conveniently forgot my appointment with the dentist twice. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm thinking, oof. Uh, yeah, why don't we plan a month from now? <laughs> I don't want to go. Because the dentist, if you, if you had, okay, and, you know, like a name, um, what do they call it? When you say a word, you had another name. Name, whatever. Name association. Dentist, pain. <laughs> dentist, pain. Headache, pain. But we leverage that fear of going to the dentist with a fear of having rotten teeth. And when you smile, having people go, oh, gosh, shut your mouth. What is <laughs> Ugly. With having such bad breath from the foul, decaying teeth. I could go on, but I won't. Listen. <laughs> of the fear of having an infection in your tooth where they got to pull the tooth out, then dig down the gum, go all the way down to the do, do, down to the uh, jaw and scrape it. <laughs> they got to do that sometimes. And I got a, res- a lot of respect for dentist. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tucker went with us down to El Salvador. I'm telling you, I heard the screamings. <laughs> Luckily, we had Novocaine. It was mostly the kids. You know, I, I saw how dentists do it. They had, the, they had the needle back like this. Hi, nice kid. Urgh, you know. <laughs> Oh, okay. But anyway, I'm telling you, you be proud of Dr. Tucker. He did. I mean, he, he was a, uh, he worked hard. Listen, honestly, he worked harder than anybody else. I mean, some of those, t- never mind. I, 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 I was, because they don't understand English. I, you, I'm such, I, next victim. <laughs> like that. Oh, uh, that didn't, anyway. All right. I honestly did that. I, sh- I, I shouldn't have. But. <laughs> so the best way to leverage a fear, to conquer a fear, is with another person. Um, what about, there's, there's another real quick example that I got written down here, and that's the fear of looking for a job or a fear of having a job. No one likes to look for a job. If you like to look for a job, you're mental. <laughs> I mean, you know, hat in hand, please. Will you please hire me? You know, no one likes to do that. But we overcome the fear, we overcome the fear of going looking for a job with not having a job. That's worse. And there's, you know, we could go, we could go on and on. When it comes to money, we have a fear of not having enough. Now, in my life, I'm just going to tell you, I, overcome the, I overcame years ago the fear of not having enough with the fear of not having God involved in my financial future. Amen. I overcome my fear of not having enough. When, when I, when, I mean, I've many times in my life, Mary and I have tithed not knowing where the rest is coming from, believe me. It's amazing how God always comes through. But anyway, and there were times when it didn't seem like he did. But we just kept tithing and then... The year went by, I looked back and go, oh, I guess he did. But I overcame the fear of not having enough by the fear of not having God involved in my financial future. Guys, listen. Right now, our government, blessed be its name, um, it doesn't seem like they're making wise decisions. Okay? And I'm not talking about Democrats or Republicans or independents. As far as I'm concerned, when they get back there, they drink some Kool-Aid. I don't understand it. (laughs) But if you've got your faith in some pension, a government pension, maybe you're a former fireman or or, or a policeman, I'm just warning you. If you've worked for the city or the government for years and you've got this pension coming in, Look what happened in Greece. All of a sudden they got cards going, sorry, you can only give me 50%. My father's pension. We guarantee you this pension. My mother got a letter, 50%. Sorry, don't have the money. Now, if that can happen in the private sector, what makes people think that it won't happen? I'm not trying to bum you out. I'm just trying to say, hey, 
put your faith in God. And I, you know, I hope you I hope that pension that six, seven, eight, whatever the pension, hope you get it for the rest of your life. I'm just saying. The amount of money, the amount of people paying into the system versus the amount of money people taking out of the system at some point, and it looks like not very far in the future, there's going to be more people that want than are giving, right? I mean, whatever. And I'm not spouting any kind of political thing here. I'm just looking at this thing going, oh, my goodness. And they all say, Democrats, for every something has to be done, but they don't. They don't do anything. They keep kicking the can, they call kicking the can down the road. Am I right? And I'm just like the rest of you. I got a 401k. It looks like you know I'm, yeah, I'm starting to get some money there. Yeah, I'm getting old, getting some money. But I I, I know my history. In the 1930s, people had all kinds of and people were wealthy. One day, the next the, the next day, they had nothing. Anyway, I am way off my notes talking about something. But anyway, we, sh we have, I, I overcome, I, in my life, I over, the point is, in my life, I overcame the, the, the fear of not having enough for retirement or whatever with the fear of not having God in my financial future. That's why I gave what I gave the last um, campaign that we have, and it's why I'm going to go tonight and give some of my retirement. Because you can't outgive God, guys. The good and faithful servant understands God bless the generosity. Tonight we have an opportunity to be generous and give. And, and I can say, I know Mark's not here. He's, he was at uh, first service. But, you know, I can speak for him too. We don't want any of you to go there tonight and give out of some compulsion or, or uh, guilt or begrudgingly. Give because you're excited about it. Give because you're excited about sowing into God's kingdom. And that, that money is going to be used to fix a building that is going to be able to reach more kids for Jesus. That's what we're doing tonight. We're investing in the kingdom of God. We're planting seeds. That's, that's what you're doing. And I hope you do it tonight. And I, hope, I hope you come. But you do it with a cheerful heart. I'm excited about it. I know that my financial planner, when he sees what I'm going to give, what are you doing? I'm sowing seeds, brother. And the way my kids are spending it, I, I better sow more. <laughs> so that's enough. Let me, let, let me have the uh, worship team up here. So to be good and faithful stewards of our finances, the first thing we've got to understand is that God is the owner of our vineyard. And of all the things that I said this morning, that's going to be the hardest thing for you to put into practice. Because it is for me. Secondly, God has called us to be good managers of the vineyard that he's given us. And then thirdly, God has called us to be generous. Lord Jesus, as we go into this final part of the service, it's the most important part. It's time when we can respond to what you've been speaking to us, speaking to us as individuals from maybe since... <clears throat> early part of this week, since we got up this morning, since we came in here. Let's all stand. <clears throat>